Uh, welcome, everyone, and I'm so glad that you're here uh, to listen to my talk about the Navajo Code Talkers. I know there's quite a few of you that probably uh, maybe have never heard of them, but the Code Talkers were a select group of Navajo Marines who devised a secret code during World War II. And this code was used to send uh, messages over the radio waves uh, during World War II in the South Pacific. And there was a group of these uh, code talkers that devised the code. My father was one of the code talkers. So this photo that you have up here um, is a picture of the um, statue that sits in Window Rock, Arizona, which is uh, the capital of the Navajo Nation. This is in Arizona. And um, the, this is actually how they use this radio. They have the radio on their back, and they would send messages over the radio waves. And I think I need to, okay. So first of all, I want to introduce myself to you, and this is the language that the Navajo Code Talkers used during World War II. She'e Laura Tohi in the Sena Bikinisha, Torich Eatni Bashish Chin, Johanna E. Tosanado, Dasha Che Doma Edesh Gajni Dasha Nala, Sasa Anna Wallier at Ayasi Nasha, Shama E. Laura Florence Walliande, Shaja E. Benson Tohi Walliande, A World War II Gotranas Bak, Co Talker and Blinde, Ade Arizona State University, the Banashish, Professor Nishin, English Department, Gone. So this is the language they use, and I'm introducing myself. I said um, my name, and um, I am Sleepy Rock People Clan, born for the Bitterwater People Clan, and my maternal grandfather clan are the Sun Clan people, and my paternal grandfather clan are the Coyote Pass people. Um, both of my parents have passed. My mother's name was Laura Florence, and my father's uh, name was Benson Tohi, and he was a code talker during World War II. And you heard the part about the English department, which is uh, where I currently teach as a professor. And I um, identified myself as a Diné, or Navajo woman. Uh, we've been called Navajo, but we also call ourselves Diné, which means the people. So my um, talk today is on the code talkers and who they were, how they contributed um, to World War II in the South Pacific, and how the Japanese uh, never deciphered this code. It was a highly um, specialized code because it used the Navajo language. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of how the code talkers came to be, and then I'll talk about the code itself. Now, what you see up here, it says the Navajo Code Talkers, and right underneath that says Nechizad Ben Dasi Ba. This is the way the language is written today. It has these diacritical marks you can see on the E and at the very end, and they tell you how to pronounce the words. But when the Code Talkers were devising the code, they didn't have this. They didn't know how to um, use this, even though it was written at the time, so that everything that they devised for the code was phonetically um, were phonetic with words. So this means with our language, we fought a war. Now what started all this was uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which is called the Day of Infamy. Uh, on December 7th, 1941, the alarm went out. It said, Air Raid, Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. And this was when uh, this uh, uh, base in Honolulu was attacked. Now, this man here, Philip Johnston, was instrumental in getting the Navajo Code Talkers um, this code established. He was a veteran of World War I, and it's said that he was raised on the Navajo reservation. He was um, um, fluent. They said that he could speak Navajo language, and he had heard about the success of other Code Talkers, like, for example, the Choctaw. They're also a, an indigenous American group that used their language in the war as well, so he'd heard about this. And being that he'd been raised on the reservation, he brought this idea uh, forward to the Marines. And uh, because the Marines at this time, uh, in the South Pacific, uh, all their messages that were being sent over the radio waves were being broken by the Japanese. And uh, so they were desperate to find a, a code that could be used. 
And so Philip Johnston said, you know, why don't we do a test and bring in some Navajos that are enlisted, in, that have enlisted into the Marines. So that's what they did. Um, they they um, got two groups of young uh, Navajo enlistees, asked them if they were fluent in Navajo and English, and if they said yes, then they separated these two groups. They put one in one room and another group in another room, and they were given a message to send to the other room over the telephone. They did this several times, back and forth, and every time the code was accurate and there were no mistakes. So very quickly then, they decided to go ahead and uh, make the Navajo language into a code. So they enlisted these, uh, these young men that were enlisted, came from various parts of the Navajo homeland, the Navajo reservation. You can see up here on the this side of the screen is Arizona. And they, many of the code talkers came from the Arizona side. And on this side here, on the right side, that green line is uh, New Mexico. Some of them came from there, but most of them came from the Arizona side. And a few years ago, I uh, was, um, I worked on a book called Code Talker Stories in which I interviewed the last of, well, some of the last of the code talkers. I was able to interview 20 of the code talkers and some of their descendants. Since that time, this the book was published in 2012, at least half of the code talkers have passed. There were originally 29 uh, code talkers who devised the code. Those are all gone today. So they, um, after they enlisted, they were sent to Camp Elliott near San Diego, California. There, there they took the basic training just like everyone else, and uh, they went through the training and completed it. And then there was a platoon that was established, a 382nd platoon, U.S. Marine Corps, San Diego, 1942. And again, this is where the first 30 uh, Navajos were uh, assigned to come up with this code, but for some reason, one dropped out. So then there were only 29 that devised the code, and then they taught the, um, the rest of the code talkers that enlisted. By the, by the end of the war, there were over 432 code talkers that had enlisted, and my father was one of them. <clears throat> now this picture is, um, shows how they were using the radio. The, the one on the right, is either sending or receiving a message, and the one on the left is writing it down. They're transmitting this, uh, these messages in Navajo, just like the language I use. And they would, the one on the left would write it down and then pass that message on to whoever was their officer or their commanding officer. They did this, and they would carry the, the radio. They had to uh, care for it, take care of it if it didn't work. And sometimes uh, they would also have to take messages on foot. And when I was interviewing these co talkers for the book, they said that um, sometimes um, they had to um, leave that spot where they were sending the message from because the Japanese would uh, determine their location, and so they would have to move away from there. And the caption here says Navajo co talkers of World War II um, befuddled the enemy. Now these uh, co-talkers, uh, they came from these boarding schools on the Navajo Reservation. This was the era of, of assimilation where um, Native American students all over America were required um, to become assimilated into mainstream America. And this meant to erase indigenous languages. Um, I went to one of these schools at the latter part of the 1950s. And in this school um, that I went to, if I or any of my classmates were caught speaking Navajo, the teacher made us stand in the corner facing the wall or we had our hands slapped with a ruler. And some stories also say that um, some students had their hand, their mouths washed out with soap. So 
it was a very harsh punishment to speak your, your language in school. And this is the era that these code talkers were coming from when they were not allowed to speak um, their language in school. And if they wanted to speak their language, they had to leave the school grounds um, a distance away from the school so they wouldn't be punished for it. And uh, let me go back to that photo. This schools, uh, these schools that were established on the reservations throughout the United States were modeled after military, uh, the military. The man who started these schools was um, a Richard uh, Pratt, who was a veteran of the Civil War. And it was really his idea that um, established the first boarding schools in this country. The first one was established in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And then um, after that, all the schools that were built by the government uh, were modeled after this, these schools that Pratt established. And I was in one of these schools uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And I was also uh, required, like my classmates, we were uh, expected to become Christianized. And um, we, our native clothing was taken away. We were uh, required to wear clothing like everyone else. Our hair was cut and cut very short, male and female. And um, these schools, some of these um, that were established, uh, the, ki the kids that went to these schools were not allowed sometimes to return home to their families sometimes for months or even years. There's lots of, of, of um, very uh, dark stories about the um, Indian school period. And this is when the co-talkers that went to these schools, they learned how to march in the schools. And the school that I went to had that as well. I remember the principal would put on the loudspeaker a John Philip Sousa march. And so we'd march from our classroom down to the uh, dining room, you know, just like little soldiers. We had to get in line and walk down the cement, and we'd get to the um, dining room or wherever. And so to this day, I can identify a John Philip Sousa march. <laughs> so these uh, young men uh, that came from these schools, they had already learned how to march. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but th this is a quote from some of the... Um, the commanding officers who said that instructors could not think of any drill or force marches too tough for the Navajo. In his evaluation, one general wrote that as far as survival training was concerned, the Navajos are without peer. And then, and then a quote from one of the cook talkers says, we were known as the toughest platoon at boot camp. We had done so much marching at boarding school that the drills were no problem. Hiking in the desert of California with with a heavy pack was not worse than hauling water in the canyon on midsummer. And I'd done that since I was four. The coat talkers were uniquely qualified to become soldiers because of the background that they came from. In the 1940s, um, as there still is today, there's a lot of poverty. Uh, the people didn't have uh, vehicles like they do today. Um, they traveled either on horseback or by covered wagon. Uh, and these are wagons that um, they took from the, the pioneers that came across. They took those wagons, and that became the mode of transportation. And uh, when they needed to gather um, heat for their homes, they had to hitch up a team of mules or horses on the wagon and drive it up to the mountains. And since there were no power tools, they chopped it by hand. All day process probably, and maybe more. So they would gather the wood, bring it down, and stack it near their homes. So you'd have these long poles uh, stacked up next to each other. Well, someone still had to chop it up and bring it inside the house, so that's what they had to do. Everyone had to help. They chopped up the, the wood, brought it into the home. The same thing with water. As you can see, this home doesn't have any running water or modern conveniences. So they, again, they had to hitch up the team of, of mules or horses, drive it to the well or to the water source, bring it home in these huge barrels, 
and then someone would have to bring it in by the buckets. And this was something that, you know, they were used to doing hard labor. Uh, their bodies were physically fit. They, if they needed to go somewhere, like I said, they either went by horseback or they walked. So they were uh, physically fit to carry out this kind of uh, military life. It was not a big stretch for them. Uh, I found this photo in my father's belongings, and uh, his sister sent him this uh, postcard. And you can't see it, but the words up on top, over there on the left side, she wrote on there, is this you? This is an um, English class at Ganado Mission uh, in Ganado, Arizona, around 1942 to 1945. And uh, that's what it would have looked like during that time period. This man here was my father's classmate. His name is Keith Little. And when I interviewed the co-talkers for this book, this is what he said about, uh, Navajo, about native language erasure. Now, this was a Presbyterian mission school, so they had the real strong disciplinary rules that we don't speak our native language, and to take us away from our cultural religions and our beliefs. And there's another man, um, this is Samuel Holliday, and he said, and then I was told not to speak Navajo, only English, and it was very difficult for me, but I've been trying my best. When they got into the service, and they were told that they would be devising a code to use in the war, they were astounded. You can imagine how soon that there you know, this total reversal of don't speak your language. Now use your language because we're going to use it as a secret weapon. They uh, took this training at Camp Elliott in San Diego, and here they are. They're learning the code or devising the code. The year is unknown. After they completed their basic training and they had learned the code, they were sent out to various places in the Pacific. They uh, went to Iwo Jima, which is kind of like in the middle. It's a little island here, south of Japan. This was situated in a strategic location. The Japanese had that island, and the uh, Americans were to go in and take that island. And it took a lot longer than expected. There was a lot of fighting there and a lot of casualties, as you could imagine. Uh, when I interviewed some of these co-talkers, they told me about what it was like when they landed on these beaches and how that when the first wave hit, um, they pretty much got wiped out. The second wave hit, and there were many casualties. And by the third or fourth wave, uh, more got through. But it was um, devastating, they said, when they looked on the beaches and saw their fallen comrades laying on the beaches. And then they also talked about how when they looked out into the ocean, uh, they didn't know what these white forms were. And they looked closer, and it was they were bodies, dead bodies floating out on the ocean. So these are some of the things that they, they talked about. And they were sent all over. The South Pacific, they went, um, this is the, the Marshall Islands here. Uh, down here is New Zealand and um, Australia, and over here is uh, the United States. But they fought in all these areas. They, some of them went to the Philippines, and uh, all these little islands, they were in Okinawa. After the bomb was dropped in Japan, a few ended up going to Japan to police it. My father ended up over in China, uh, in Peking, which is now uh, Beijing. He was hospitalized there, but he never told us uh, about his service as a co-talker. This is the same story I heard from all the descendants that I spoke with. They didn't know their father or their grandfather had been co-talkers. When they were discharged from the Marines, they were sworn to secrecy. And one of the co-talkers said he was even threatened with uh, imprisonment if he said anything. So they were told not to tell their family or friends or relatives, no one. The reason why is in the event the code needed to be used again, it would be ready. So the code was had to be protected, it was classified. 
So this is where they went all over in these islands, and um, they went by ship. They didn't go to Europe. They only stayed in the South Pacific. And this is another photo of the code talkers. They learned uh, how to you know, use their um, guns and uh, bayonets. They were trained to do that. And they fought with uh, those weapons as well. And my father, um, this was in China around 1944 to 1945. Um, <coughs> passed in 1994. And he was only um, 16 when he enlisted. He got his uh, parents to sign for him and say that he was 17. Um, some of the code talkers did enlist uh, at this age, even though uh, they weren't supposed to. Again, a couple of code talkers, um, again, they're using the radio, sending a message. The, the messages were always delivered uh, precisely as they were sent. They're, they were accurate, and they were never deciphered by the Japanese. And a photo of one of the code talkers on one of the beaches. And uh, the man on the top is um, Carl Gorman, who was one of the original 29 code talkers who devised the code. And the two down below are uh, two of the other code talkers, and they are uh, out in the South Pacific. The man on the right, I knew his sister. Her name was Elise Neuendorf. She dev um, published the first uh, Navajo Children's Dictionary. This photo is uh, interesting to me. I asked the code talkers when I interviewed them, do you know who this man is on the left, sitting very close to the code talkers And of course, um, I thought he might be a bodyguard. And I asked them, did you have a bodyguard when you were in the service? And some said yes, some said no. Some said, if I had one, I didn't know. And, and they said that the bodyguard, his job was to protect them and to guard them. And if the code talker was captured, the, the bodyguard was to shoot the code talker because the code had to be protected. I don't know if that happened because I didn't hear any stories like that. And this man um, was one of the code talkers. <coughs> he uh, did not survive. He was killed in action there. And uh, the photo in the middle on top is my father, and he has kind of Asian features. Uh, the code talkers said that they were sometimes afraid that they would be um, arrested by their own um, their own marine marine comrades because um, they said that sometimes the Japanese could sneak into the camp at night, steal a uniform, put it on, and then get back into the go back into the camp and spy. And so they were very careful about um, going places on their own. Um, one of the code talkers said he always wanted to go with a white soldier. That way, you know, he would not be captured, or at least he wouldn't have any problems with that. And then these are also photos that I um, found in my father's belongings. Um, the one on top is top left is Okinawa. Now, for the, the language itself, this is the cover of the Navajo Dictionary, as they called it. Um, and it has full of stereotypes, because uh, here on this, well, this code talker here is saying, Ugh, heat better than TBY. We call that Tonto speak. Are you familiar with the Lone Ranger and Tonto television series? They were popular, and they showed them on television, I think, in the 50s and 60s. The, the, the Indian guy, Tonto, and Long Ranger, they were the good guys. And they uh, would go and have these adventures every week and fighting the bad guys. And Tonto would speak like this, this jilted kind of language. So um, we call that Tonto speak. And the one on the right says, of here. And then um, he's got a canteen that says fire water on there. And the co-talkers said that they would always be called chief. 
Chief Little or Chief Begay or Chief Toki, and one of the co-talkers said he got so tired of being called Chief, he finally said, don't call me Chief. If I was your Chief, we wouldn't be in this mess. So, you know, he kind of got tired of that. And Now, another thing that um, qualified the co-talkers was the oral tradition from which they came. Oral tradition is passing on stories, knowledge, philosophy, language, songs, ceremonies, and so forth. This is how the Navajo people would pass um, this kind of information from one generation to the next. So it relied on your memory. You had to remember things that uh, couldn't be written on paper. And that's exactly what the co-talkers did. They couldn't have any um, cheat sheets or any notes. Everything had to be put into memory. And so they had to er periodically um, refresh their, their memories of these uh, words that they were going to use. So they relied on the practice of oral traditions to memorize the code. And they had to memorize over 450 code words. The Navajo language does not have place names like Suribachi, which is that little volcano that's on uh, Iwo Jima. The way they did this is like they took like the first word Suribachi. They took S for sheep, and they translated it into Navajo. The be, U for uncle, Navajo is Bata'e. And then R for ram, then it's uh, all the way down. So when they were passing a code, they would have to say, in Navajo, the Behmota, I didn't stop him, Shashwulichi, Monsafintin. And somebody was writing this down real quick. And then it was, again, it was accurate. And here is the rest of the alphabet. There were several words for each of the letters, all the way from A to Z. They used uh, common names that everyone was familiar with. Like uh, ant, they use a lot of animal names like badger, bear, cat, cow, deer. And then they also use things that were in the home like kettle, um, hat, and all the way down like mirror, uh, needle. So a lot of animal names. The Navajo language, we don't have R's and Q's in our language, but they were able to. Uh, use the English alphabet to come up with these words. And then some of the highlights of the code. Um, again, the, we don't have words for fighter bomber, uh, dive bomber, uh, submarine, because we live in the desert. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? Well, what they did is they looked at these uh, artillery and they said fighter bomber. What does a fighter bomber do? And so they said, oh, well, it kind of moves around. And oh, they said, well, it kind of acts like a hummingbird. So that's what we'll call it. We'll call the fighter bomber a hummingbird. So they just translated that into Navajo. We call it dahitie, which means something that you know moves like this. Same thing with dive bomber. Uh, they said it acts like a chicken hawk. So and that word is gin. And the same thing, observation plane. It's like an owl. It sits and observes things, so they called it Neshja. And I like the, the grenade one, because they called it potatoes. And they mm -hmm. uh, just translate it into Namasi, which, you know, you can hold it in your hand and you can throw it. So these were things that they were able to just, you know, using what was around them. And I thought this was ingenious to look at these words, and then they said, you know, how can we come up with a word and they just describe what it does and then translate it into Navajo? There were uh, 29 gold medal recipients. These were the original 29 that devised the code. And then there were 403 silver medal recipients. There were 13 uh, code talkers killed in action in the South Pacific. Uh, the Navajos have always known about post-traumatic stress disorder. In the mythic stories, there are stories of these twin hero brothers who make the world safe, but in the process, they've engaged in war and the violence and bloodshed and so forth. And they suffered from PTSD. 
and the, the, the Navajo people prayed for a vision, they prayed for a way to help the, the twins, and they were given a ceremony, it's called the Enemy Way Ceremony. Um, some of the use, the uses of that is to help treat uh, PTSD. So the uh, twin hero brothers had this uh, ceremony which lasts over a number of days, and uh, they were by then, uh, uh, they were treated with that. This is a uh, healing, one of the healing practices <coughs> of the Navajo is this Navajo sand painting, and here's a medicine man um, using different colors of sand to create a sand painting, and this is used in the healing ceremonies. So this is one of the ways that they were healed. Um, some of the code talkers said that before they went into service, they had a blessing for them that would protect them, and others had a ceremony for them while they were in the military, and then some when they came back. One of the code talkers said that when he returned, he was wearing his uniform, and um, the medicine man was at his home when he returned, and the medicine man told him to take off his uniform and bury it near his home, and never wear it again, never put, put it back on. You can visit it, he's told them, but don't ever put it back on. So that's uh, partly the way they um, the way they dealt with PTSD. So after the co twin hero brothers had this ceremony, then they were able to resume their life among their community and their family. So the chronology of the Code Talker events was in 1919. Um, some American Indians were given citizenship based <coughs> on their military service. So the Code Talkers, when they enlisted, including my grandfather, who was in World War I, um, did not have U.S. citizenship. I'm sorry, I should take that back. My, the, my grandfather did not have U.S. citizenship. The Code Talkers had U.S. citizenship. So in the, then in 1920, the 19th Amendment gives women the right to vote. In 1924, all American Indians are given citizenship. And then in 1942, in February, Philip Johnson uh, proposes that the Navajo language be uh, used as a code. And then in a few months later, 30 Navajos uh, are selected by the Marine recruiters to develop the code. And in June by that year, the code is developed and tested. And then in August, uh, the code is ready to go. Uh, the 27 Navajos go to fight in the South Pacific and two stay behind as recruiters and to teach the next group. And then 1942 to 1945, the code talkers increase in number and they go to fight in various places in the South Pacific. 1945, World War II ends and the uh, Marines return to the reservation. Then in 1948, American Indians in Arizona are given voting rights. This is what I thought was so ironic that the Coke Talkers, when they uh, were discharged, didn't even have voting rights in Arizona. In 1968, the code is declassified, and this is when we finally learn who the Coke Talkers were and what they did, and what their service was. 1969, uh, there's the reunion of the Navajo Code Talkers. In 71, the Code Talker Association is formed. And then in 1982, President Ronald Reagan proclaims National Code Talkers Day. And that's celebrated every August by the Navajo Nation in Unilaw. <clears throat> 1995, uh, History Channel does a documentary on them. And then in 2001, George W. Bush and the Navajo Nation uh, honor all the Code Talkers in Washington and in um, Winter Rock, Arizona, and this doll came out. This is the um, Navajo Coat Talker doll. It's a G.I. Joe doll. And uh, I bought this, I think, in Toys R Us. It was a toy store. And if you look on the back, it gives you a little bit of information about the Coat Talkers, and then you can press this button. It says, it so says it in Navajo, then he uh, translates it. And they have in here, it's the radio and their, their rifle bayonet on it. I found some later on on eBay, and I think they're very expensive to buy now. So 
So the reason why they went to war is they wanted to protect the earth. Um, they wanted to protect uh, all things that were sacred uh, on the earth. They were concerned for the future of America. Uh, they also had uh, joining the service um, gave them <coughs> economic benefits for family and, and themselves, and they liked the military uniform. So when the recruiters came to their high school and they were all dressed up in their finest, they saw that uniform and they said, I don't want to look like that. So they signed. <laughs> and this is the letter from uh, President um, Reagan proclaiming Nav National Navajo Protocol Day and the mural in downtown Gallup, New Mexico. All those animals that you see in there were used in the code. The man down below is Albert Smith. He passed a few years ago. And Mr. Keith Little. This is the Navajo coat talker uniform now. They usually wear these gold shirts and either khaki pants or denim jeans. And they wear their medals and their uh, turquoise jewelry. And this man here is reunited with his um, bodyguard in 1987. Um, this is the program from 2001, the Navajo Nation, when they honored all the code talkers. And this is how they look. All these men that you see now have passed on. They are now in their 90s, and they still give talks, and they go around. Uh, visiting schools and colleges and various places. Some of them um, have to get around by um, wheelchair, but they, they like to get out and uh, stay active. This is the uh, Navajo Code Talker bronze medal. You can see a, photo, a picture of two Code Talkers. And, uh, my father received one of these medals. The back of it says the U.S. Marine Corps World War II and um, which means they never broke, it was an unbroken code. Now, the, the piece to this image in the middle here uh, symbolize the, the twin hero brothers, uh, Monster Slayer and Child Born for Water. Every year, the code talkers are honored at, in Wingo Rock uh, at a parade and people want to shake their hands and say hello. And this is Mr. Peaches, one of the still living, lives in Benzlum, Arizona. And that's the end of my presentation. So I may have gone over a little bit. I don't know if you have any questions or comments. Yes. Thank you, Laura. That was really fascinating. And I was wondering, you said in 1968 they made the decision to declassify the code. Yes. Um, what's the reason you think that was behind that decision? They no longer, at that point, decided, the Marines decided they no longer needed that code. And you were an oratorium. Did you do for an enemy player? <coughs> yes, I did. Can you uh -huh. tell people about that really briefly? Because it's so interesting. I was uh, commissioned by the Phoenix. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I said that um, I know Laura wrote an oratorio for the Phoenix Symphony um, called Enemy Slayer a few years ago. It was fantastic. And I just wondered if she would talk about it for a second. Oh, I was commissioned by the Phoenix Symphony to write this um, libretto for Enemy Slayer in Navajo Oratorio. And it's about a soldier or a veteran who comes back from one of the Middle Eastern wars with PTSD. And the story is he, like um, veterans who suffer from PTSD, goes through these various stages of, of PTSD. And the Navajo Nation or the Navajo people have always known about PTSD, so in this oratorio, um, I wrote about how he becomes um, healed uh, through uh, prayer, sacred prayer, sacred texts, and uh, through the coming together of family and community and extended family. And this is one of the ceremonies that we have uh, in the Navajo uh, culture. And so this oratorio was about that, and some of it is a lot about is about anti-war because I think you know in in 
in any war, you know, it's not just the veterans and the soldiers and the warriors who fight in the war, it's everyone else. It's the rest of us, family and and friends and people that are left behind and the people that send their sons and daughters. Um, it's about us too. And so I felt that should be a part of this oratorio. And so that is in there too as well. But by the end of the oratorio, um, he, he it starts out in the east because uh, I use a lot of Navajo um, symbols, east as the place of beginnings. <coughs> so the soldier comes back from the east side and goes to the south. And every time he arrives at another cardinal position going from south to west to north, his PTSD um, <coughs> um, becomes more pronounced and uh, he falls deeper into um, the darkness until finally when he arrives to the north side, uh, he's ready to commit suicide. Uh, but at the very end, um, all this time there's the, these voices of his family and ancestors that are trying to sing him back into the light. And by the end of the, when he gets to the north side, he either has to uh, make the decision to end his life or um, decide to live on. So he decides to, to live on. So that's the way the, the oratorio was, um, was um, created, uh, using Navajo symbols and the, the uh, healing ceremony. And um, so it was, it was a lot of fun to, to write that. So. I don't know if you have any other questions. Yeah. Laura, I was wondering if after 1968, then did your dad feel free enough to talk about this? Or is he like so many World War II veterans? Yes, yes. Like many veterans, they don't want to talk about the war, what they did. My father was like that. I didn't find out until 1983. Um, that's what he had done. And actually, I was teaching a class here, I think in 1999 or something, and one of my students did his um, research on the Code Talkers. And it was actually through him that I found out a lot about the Code Talkers. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.